The date, April 3rd. The year, 2156. The Alpha Quadrant stands in the midst of a brutal conflict. A conflict in which the destiny of the entire region will be determined. Earth, a world which had worked so hard to bring about peace and cooperation between the peoples of this region, now finds itself embroiled in a brutal conflict, a struggle for its very survival. Their implacable foe, the Romulan Empire, seeks control of the region and its people, one by one, isolating them and bringing them under the shadow of the raptor's wings. Until recently, the Romulans seemed to be unstoppable, capturing system after system. But when Captain Archer led a bold counter-attack, he succeeded in driving the Romulans from Berengaria. However, the war was far from won. In the shadows, sharp talons stood ready to strike at the heart of humanity itself, Earth. While Archer's victory at Berengaria was far from insignificant, its effect was more morale than military in its value. While Kassara had taken heavy casualties, the core of his fleet remained and had retreated to Deneva, where he would regroup. Although Archer himself was far from unscathed, losing seven Daedalus-class ships in the battle, he was unable to effectively pursue Kassara he was instead forced to halt at Berengaria and regroup before attempting any further offensives, lest he make the same mistakes Kassara had merely five months before, attacking Altair under strength only to be repelled. This failed attack by Kassara nonetheless caused alarm amongst the ranks of Starfleet Command and saw the development of a Fortress Earth policy. Yet for the moment, Starfleet Command still supported Archer's offensives. Yet this was far from unconditional, and any failure might lead them to reconsider this position. Another effect of Berengaria's liberation was the opening of crucial supply lines between Earth, Vulcan and Andoria. Unfortunately, this did not guarantee support from these parties. The Vulcans, having recently stated their commitment to peace and pacifism, were sympathetic to the concerns of Earth, but ultimately reluctant to provide military support. Meanwhile, the Andorians had no qualms regarding military action, but were stubbornly committed to doing so on their own terms. Therefore, Starfleet Command decided to attempt to secure greater cooperation and support by sending two of its most accomplished officers to win support, sending Commander Topol to Vulcan and Admiral Archer to Andoria, leaving the fleet under the command of Ramirez, who, while capable, lacked Archer's experience. Meanwhile, the Romulans were forced to take stock of their situation. While Kassara had been driven back from Berengaria, he still had a foothold on Deneva and remained in position to strike Earth, although he would have to take Altair, by no means an easy task, and now the humans expected him. The humans were fortunately completely ignorant of D. Diridex's position, who had assembled a large fleet and stood ready to strike at the human colony of Tau Ceti on the Tellarite border the capture of which would sever supplies between Earth and Teleprime. Yet Diderodex remained cautious. Having learned of Archer's counterattack, he resolved to ensure that he did not face a similar counterattack. He did so by ordering Kassara to attack Altair simultaneously with his own. The goal of this was ultimately to confuse and delay any response by Starfleet rather than necessarily capturing Altair itself. Fortunately for Starfleet, 
Diderotex's caution allowed them to secure the support they needed from their allies, administrator to POW having agreed to provide military support, but strictly for defensive deployments. Nevertheless, this was a substantial diplomatic and military victory for Earth, now backed up with Vulcan firepower. While for the most part the Vulcan fleet was composed of scientific and exploration vessels, the policy of defence through deterrence under the previous administration led to the creation of the mighty Dekir class heavy cruiser. At 600 metres long, she was among one of the largest vessels of the 22nd century and would hold the record until the 24th century. It was surprisingly well armed for a Vulcan ship, with three dorsal, two ventral, port starboard and aft plasma phasers, and three torpedo launchers. The space frame itself was constructed with combat in mind, as the normally vulnerable warp ring was placed within the ship's mass, allowing it to rotate to a horizontal position and thus protecting it during combat. The Dakir could further augment its fighting ability by deploying a daughter craft 180 meters in length. Similar craft would not be seen on Federation ships until the 24th century. The Vulcans immediately sent ships to reinforce Berengaria and Altair, while the Andorians had agreed to assign a squadron to Archer's task force to be led by Brigadier Shran, a long-standing ally of the humans. Despite these preparations, Starfleet was caught off guard when on June 20th, the Duradex brought down a hammer blow on Tau Seti, attacking with 15 ships, including two Tavaros, 10 Sparrows, and three U-24 Veronus battlecruisers. The U-24 Veronus, or Chowder, as it is known by the humans, is a three-nacelled battlecruiser. A newer design than the Tyrannus, it was capable of significantly faster warp speeds, and as such was an effective offensive cruiser. With a length of 126 meters, a wingspan of 68 meters, and a draft of 68 meters, it is smaller than the Tyrannus, but boasts a potent weapons complement of one heavy plasma cannon, two light plasma cannons on the wings, and six torpedo launchers. However, it boasts this firepower at the cost of protection, with weak shields and thin hull armour. Thus, in an attack, the Veronus relies on smaller vessels, such as the Sparrow, to draw the enemy's attention away from the Veronus, allowing it to unleash its firepower without fear of a response. The Tau Seti system was lightly defended by Starfleet, who believed Kassara to be the main threat. Thus, it was only lightly defended by a joint Starfleet Tellarite squadron of five ships, two Tellarite cruisers and three warp deltas, neither of which were intended for combat. Nonetheless, they would find themselves fighting regardless. Fortunately, they were joined by the Atlantis NX-05, giving them a fighting chance, or so they believed. The warp delta was an old design from the 2120s, as a Warp 3 frigate, however, was now more of a scout and patrol vessel. At 120 meters long and 105 meters wide, she was once considered top of the line, but for the most part was only seen in rear echelons during the war. Armed with only two laser cannons and no ordnance launcher, she was unsuited to frontline service. When D. Duradex came out of warp, he initially kept his distance and attempted to use his telecapture devices to turn the enemy fleet against itself. However, he was unsuccessful. Both Starfleet and the Tellarite vessels were protected by new security programs. These are now known today as the CCP, or Command Console Prefix, a code which serves as a firewall against computer commands from an outside source. D. Dirdex was surprised by the human's resourcefulness. Nonetheless, he was undeterred, pressing his advantage, attacking in a phalanx formation. The Sparrow Squadron under Veximus led the attack, quickly closing on the Coalition position behind Tau Seti's moon. 
The coalition forces under Captain Weiss engaged Veximus, ignoring the advance of Diderdex's battlecruisers. Meanwhile, Veximus targeted the communication arrays of the coalition, doing only superficial damage to critical systems. And while he lost three sparrows, his efforts made Diderdex's hammer blow all the more efficacious. Diderdex was able to close to near point blank range before opening fire with a devastating volley of plasma cannon and missiles, destroying three coalition ships and causing disarray in the fleet as they were now unable to communicate. Veximus driving his squadron like a wedge between the humans and Tellarite as they fled the wrath of the Verona's battlecruisers and into the sights of the two Tavaros under Commander Cassi, who had been hidden with sensor screens. Trapped between the hidden Tavaros and the pursuing Sparrows, the Coalition fleet was torn apart, ship by ship. Captain Weiss attempted to lead one last effort but was destroyed by Diderdex's flagship, the Imperator. In less than an hour, the Romulans had taken Talceti and now stood ready to strike their ultimate objective, Earth. Meanwhile, Kassara's attack was far less successful, attacking with only a single Tavaro and three Sparrows against a coalition fleet of 12 ships, including a Vulcan heavy cruiser flotilla, and Kassara lost all his Sparrows, barely escaping himself. This would be the last offensive action that would be led by Kassara during the war. As a result, Starfleet quickly realized that the threat was from Diduridex, not Kassara, and as such were able to orientate their defense accordingly. Between Earth and Tau Ceti resided Alpha Centauri. Already a thriving colony of nearly one billion, Starfleet Command was faced with an impossible choice to risk their remaining fleet in a battle over Alpha Centauri, with the potential to leave Earth defenseless, or abandon one billion people to certain extermination by the Romulans. A third option was desperately needed. Captain Erica Hernandez proposed an ambitious solution, the total evacuation of Alpha Centauri colony. Unfortunately, it was determined that few could be evacuated before the Romulans arrived. In order to allow the time needed, Captain Hernandez proposed that she lead a small unit consisting of the Columbia NX-02, Constellation NX-04 and four intrepid frigates, and fight a guerrilla campaign attacking the flanks of Diderdex as he advanced on Alpha Centauri, slowing him as much as possible. Unfortunately, even then, they would be unlikely to evacuate everyone. There were simply not enough ships. However, General Casey of Mako Command offered a solution. Rather than evacuate the entire population from the system, they could instead hide the population amongst the various planets in the system and more and move them with sublight transports. The hope was that the Romulans would be so focused on Earth they would not question where one billion people had disappeared to, and even if they found one group of refugees, most would likely go safely unnoticed. Starfleet Command greenlit the plan on June 27, 2156. However, Hernandez was only assigned half the ships to her raiding squadron, consisting of Columbia, Indefatigable, and Dauntless. The Dirdex departed Tau Ceti on the 4th of July, 2156, expecting to reach Alpha Centauri by the end of the month. His fleet had swelled to 25 ships, consisting of four Verona's battlecruisers, 14 Sparrows and four Tavaros, supported by three large carriers with a total of 10,000 embarked troops. D. Duridex was confident that such a fleet could crush Starfleet and obliterate Earth. On July 12th, Starfleet Command received a report from Captain Hernandez, confirming she had encountered and engaged D. Diridex, beginning the Battle of Alpha Centauri. What should have taken D. Diridex less than a month, instead nearly cost him two. Many of his ships had sustained damage and were low on ordnance, and he had lost three Sparrows and a Tavaro. The fleet that had departed Tau Ceti looked very different to the fleet that arrived at Alpha Centauri 
on the 16th of August. And their problems continued to mount after they arrived. While no fleet awaited them, they were greeted by minefields, fighter attacks and continued raids by Colombia. It soon became clear to Duderidex that the longer he remained at Alpha Centauri, the less able he would be to take Earth. And so after three days, he departed and arrived in the Sol system on the 1st of September 2156. Having lost the element of surprise, he arrived to find a large Earth fleet and a prepared depth defense. The human fleet of Sol was under the command of Admiral Black, who masterminded the Fortress Earth policy. At his command were a total of 21 ships, including Challenger NX-03, Excalibur NX-04, four Intrepid Light cruisers, six Daedalus-class frigates, and nine warp deltas, barely outnumbering the Romulan vessels, many of which outclassed their human counterparts. Fortunately, Admiral Black was not relying too heavily in the superiority of his fleet and had several cards up his sleeve. As the Romulans dropped out of warp near Pluto, they encountered the Neptune Line. Initially, it seemed only lightly defended by one Intrepid and three warp deltas. De Dirdex was nonetheless cautious and only ordered a Tavaro and three Sparrows to engage. Suddenly, another enemy formation was detected, three Daedalus frigates. Again, De Dirdex responded, matching them ship for ship. Then another. De Dirdex realized that Admiral Black was attempting to disperse his forces and fight across a wide front in a series of small engagements. Not wishing to play into Black's hand, De Dirdex secured his flanks before throwing his full weight against the Daedalus squadron, which was driven back. Even so, only one ship was caught and destroyed, and De Dirdex had given Black exactly what he wanted, revealing the total strength of his fleet. Black pulled his ships back to the first true defensive line at Uranus. There, the fleet was split into two groups, one led by Challenger, positioned in the planetary rings, and the second led by Excalibur, positioned around the moon Oberon. Between the two, a convoy of seemingly damaged refugee ships intended to lure the Romulans into a zone of overlapping fire. This proved only partially successful, as De Dirdex was suspicious, only allowing three sparrows to engage, all of which were destroyed by overwhelming fire. Nonetheless, De Durdex now knew the human dispositions and began his attack by firing a suppressive missile barrage from his cruisers whilst ordering the Tavaros to move under sensor screens to the rear of the human fleet in the rings. He then ordered the Sparrows to engage, only holding enough back to protect his cruisers, which with greater firepower commanded the gap between Oberon and the ring. While Challenger's squadron initially seemed to have the advantage, a surprise flanking attack by Cassis Tavaros swiftly turned the tables against them, and they soon lost two Warp Deltas and two Daedalus, and an intrepid frigate, although they were able to escape, damaging a Tavaro and destroying two Sparrows. Black was forced to pull his ships back and fought a running battle at Saturn, the humans losing two Warp Deltas. Black took up a new position in the Jupiter defense line. Most of the fleet, including the NXs, took a position around Jupiter Station, whilst a small squadron, led by the Intrepid class Resolute and Implacable, as well as four Warp Deltas, held behind Jupiter's moon, hoping to outflank the Romulans. The Durdex fell for this bait, advancing his ships in his famous inexorable phalanx. As he did so, Resolute was able to flank under the cover of Jupiter's moons to the rear of De Dirdex's column. Meanwhile though, Black continued to suffer heavy losses, losing the Challenger, the Intrepid-class Indomitable, and two Daedalus cruisers. He was close to breaking. Fortuitously, Resolute was extremely successful in her flanking maneuver, catching De Dirdex completely off guard, destroying a transport and a battle cruiser. De Dirdex was forced to halt his advance and redeploy his sparrows to ward off Resolute, although two warp deltas were caught and destroyed. 
Yet Black was now able to retire in good order through the asteroid belt, but now all that stood between the Romulans and Earth was Mars. As the Dirdex emerged from the asteroid belt in Phalanx, one of his battlecruisers was obliterated by an energy beam fired by the Verteron Array. Therefore, he withdrew his cruisers into the asteroid belt and ordered his sparrows to engage, while the Tavaros, under sensor screens, moved around the fleet to attack the array. However, without cruiser support, the sparrows were outmatched and took heavy casualties. Nevertheless, Cassie was successful in destroying the array, and D. Dirdex was free to advance. It now seemed that the tide was in his favor. Yet, this was not to be. Another Verteron array opened fire from Venus, destroying the White Wind. Running low on ships and ordnance, and the human fleet still mounting a strong resistance, D. Dirdex was forced to order a retreat. And the Battle of Sol had ended. The line had held. It goes without saying that this was a critical victory for humanity. And while D. Dirdex had suffered a defeat, he would remain a significant threat during the rest of the war. In an address to his soldiers after the battle, he said this, Our enemy has repulsed our attack. This cannot and should not be denied or ignored. Any man who does so is either arrogant or ignorant. We fight a worthy foe, and he has defended his home with admirable valour and zeal. Look to your enemy for an example, for now we shall defend as hard as he did. We shall plant our feet and dare him to push, but he will fail. And afterward, we shall stand as victors for the glory of Romulus.